Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Financial Statement Analysis to Journal Reviews with Excel Tools. My name is Jim Kaplan, I'm founder of AuditNet, and with us today is my colleague and friend Rich Lanza, an ACL and audit software expert. Today's webinar is a collaboration between AuditNet and AuditSoftware.net and delivering training series focusing on audit software. We're glad you could join us today. I'll be moderating the webinar. A little bit about myself for those of you who don't know me. I'm the founder of AuditNet with a background as a chief audit executive, Internet for Auditors pioneer, and an auditor who believes and promotes the use of technology for audit. The next slide provides you with some information about AuditNet. Before we proceed to today's that's slide about me, and there's a slide about AuditNet. Uh, before we proceed to today's material and introducing our guest presenter, Rich Lanza, I'd like to go through a few important housekeeping points. The webinar is being recorded, and after the conclusion, you will receive a link to the recording. Uh, you will get the email notification with the instructions for viewing the recording. Uh, that may take five to seven days as we have to upload it and make sure that everything uh, is formatted properly. We also have a, an evaluation questionnaire that you'll see at the end of the webinar. Your feedback is very valuable, so please take a minute or two to complete the survey. In addition, because the webinar qualifies for CPE credits, we will be putting up polling questions relating to the material covered in compliance with NASBA rules. The question period will remain open for about a minute, so it's important that you respond quickly. Those answering the questions will receive their CPE certificate by email within seven to ten business days. This applies only to the live session as we're unable to offer CPE for the recorded webinar. We will take your questions during the webinar. Submit your questions via the chat window at the lower right hand box on your screen. Type your question and press return to send it. Any question we're unable to answer by the end of the webinar, we will answer directly within 48 hours. If you're having trouble with the webinar software, check to see if Java is enabled and whether you have any pop-up blockers disabled. If you're still not able to get the webinar to function, log out and log back in again. You can always join us on the audio portion uh, and listen over, uh, over the phone. So the next uh, slide provides some information about disclaimer. I'm not going to read that. That was sent out to every everyone who's registered for the webinar this morning, so you can take time to read that yourself. At this point, I'd like to turn the floor over to Rich Lanza and uh, let him get started on today's webinar. We have a lot of material to cover and I know Rich is just itching to, to get going here. Rich? Great. Thank, thanks a lot, Jim, and, and thanks everybody uh, for uh, coming today. You know, I really like journal entry testing because it's something that I've done for a long time, but also it's something that everybody has access to the data for. So, you know, o over all the years that I've been doing this, I've done a lot of payables, analytics, and general ledger is always number two. Uh, so, uh, w with that said, you know, looking forward to kind of bringing uh, to, to bear everything that, that I know about this topic uh, fr from a audit perspective, but also even from a, uh, you know, just in, in finding money, hopefully within the organization. So, uh, you know, with that said, I was going to jump into the learning objectives, uh, and the learning objectives, we have quite a bit to do, and what I wanted to do is kind of start out with uh, an overall uh, summary of just, you know, analytics within the general ledger, and it's a little more general. We're not getting into Excel yet, uh, but then I'm going to be jumping into Excel and doing quite a bit of uh, actual, you know, case study type analytics. So, you know, after the first polling question, you know, in essence, uh, we'll be uh, doing a, a lot of uh, analytics from that point forward. Uh, and not only will we do kind of the standard tests that that probably uh, you're used to, but as we get into that second bullet there, I, I want to kind of look at your general ledger from a, uh, you know, from a multiple perspective point of view, so to try to summarize it in a way, so not just tests like, you know, weekend journal entries or round journal entries, um, you know, is, but beyond that to, to other things. I also want to take a look at how the general ledger can provide like a roadmap of your accounts and, and really try to understand by journal entry what accounts are being hit and then what type of account sequences are being hit. So that's where we get a little more advanced. Uh, we'll, we'll then start taking a look at uh, you know, the general ledger keywords and, and try to think about how we can kind of search those keywords. 
we'll be graphing that as well. Uh, and, and I like in the summaries that we perform to kind of think about how can we graph it because I find the visual effect is, is always kind of creates that wow effect with people. Um, and last but not least is scoring. Uh, and I, you know, find that there, as you're going to feel at the end of uh, this two hours, there are a lot of reports, and sometimes it's hard to really figure out, you know, of the 20 reports we're going to run, which ones are good. So what scoring does is it allows you to kind of combine all those reports together so that you can actually get it into, you know, into that analysis. So uh, with that, uh, I want to kind of jump into the overall general concepts, and you know, how do, how do the audit concepts in the GL relate to analytics? So from a, an overall audit planning perspective, uh, what I try to do for the general ledger, if you can do it, is to try to get all of the data across your organization. I mean, it, it may exist within one, uh, you know, let, let's say SAP installation, uh, or it might be an Oracle, but, but it may also be spread out throughout various types of ERP systems. If you could try to get the data, uh, especially from the external auditors who normally are getting it anyway, so like quarterly, they're getting this data usually. So this is a way to kind of grab that data, even if you're not going to use it, and be able to uh, do something with it at some point. Uh, you know, if you didn't use it at that quarter end, but you at year end you do this big analytic, that's a key thing. Uh, and I, I usually will ask a, a group of people, how many people get the general ledger data for the external auditor. So, you know, you're, you're in the process of getting the data and uh, everyone's hand goes up and then I say, how many people keep it? And then everyone's hand goes down. You know, they, they seem to sort of throw it out once going to the externals. Uh, and I, I think keep that stuff, again, it, it's great big data to, to play with. Uh, what I then do is kind of run a series of tests, maybe 20 tests across each location. And our goal here is to try to almost like score the locations and figure out which one is, you know, the best one or more ripe to take a look at. Um, what we then try to do is even see where we might be able to kind of get these toolkits down at a local level. Uh, some of the reports we run, uh, I like to actually, you know, give to a CFO or a controller, and, and maybe on the webinar today even, uh, there, there are uh, financial people, because I do work with financial people directly, because they may have been bit by a fraud years ago, and now this is their proactive way of kind of getting ahead of it and, and taking a look for some of these things. So I, I don't I do feel whatever you build, you know, try to share it a bit with management. You don't want to give them your audit plan, but I think to give them a few reports to check it out uh, is good uh, and make it repeatable as well. So in, in looking, you know, what are we trying to do here? What, what I, you know, I, I, I work with a lot of audit departments that don't have audit programs. It's kind of interesting where we, we do work together, but yet the audit program kind of gets built on the fly. And I find, uh, you know, I, with that said, I'm not saying that's the best approach, but it's something where by us looking at the data, I almost don't need an audit program at times. I mean, it's something where I can just look for unusual activity and, and give people these, these you know, events or transactions that they could look at and say uh, that this is uh, very interesting. Uh, we could also, you know, just now from an auditor point of view, just kind of really check like unauthorized enters, do we have people in there that shouldn't be entering journal entries, uh, and then also just reconciling the activity. I mean, you know, when you get the GL, uh, normally the externals do this test for you, so you might be able to get it from them, even just to take a look at it and share it or, or, or at least look at it and see how they did it. Um, but, but that would uh, just give you the completeness over the data. And I, I think, again, as an overall concept, that's one one not to forget, uh, you know, all the detail analytics we're going to do today, I think one of the, the top tests that you want to do is just making sure that their trial balance, uh, the difference between the, the beginning and ending trial balance equals the detailed general ledger in the middle. Now, I'm a big uh, cost-saving type person and, and feel that, uh, you know, for the most part, there are a lot of payments that are made to vendors there that really shouldn't have been made or were, were made in excess of what they should have been made uh, for. And, and this is a way to test for it. I mean, the general ledger is a way to take a look. And, and we're going to talk about this and, and kind of show you some examples. And these are the top areas that I generally look in because they're areas that have grown into audit 
areas where, where there are actually businesses for each one of these uh, uh, you know, divisions and we're able to kind of, uh, w which basically means that there's some issues there <laughs> because if there weren't issues in, in the way utilities were processed or, or leases were processed, uh, you know, we wouldn't have auditors that exist for, for that area. So uh, it, it's something where I like to look at the spend and make sure that I'm looking at these areas, maybe even try to see how I can uh, uh, audit these areas potentially myself uh, or bring in a partner to save money for the company. And, and a big goal here, you know, aside from finding errors and finding fraud like we're, we're looking at here, I like to save the company money because at the end of the day, uh, that, that is something that they usually remember more so than uh, the fraud or, or some of these other things that they almost want to forget about. Like those are bad, you know, bad memories. Uh, these are all the different types of fraud. Over in the, the top right corner, I can't really scroll into it, but that top right corner is financial statement fraud. And I think that's really where we're focusing mostly today uh, when, when we think about uh, the general ledger and, you know, what we're trying to do here. Uh, I think for the most part, a lot of it is, is financial statement fraud. But what I'm finding interesting from a big data perspective is that the, uh, a lot of the, the systems out there from a, a, a SAP or Oracle perspective, uh, actually SAP definitely, I think even JDE to a large extent, uh, and Oracle, they have the information from the subledger in the general ledger for a lot of the transactions. Not all of them, but, but a lot. And that allows you uh, to identify uh, you know, any sort of, let, let's say for example, the vendor numbers are now attached to all of the transactions in the general ledger. That gives you an ability to kind of do a little bit of a vendor audit in a way and, and start to look at the spend by vendor and, and et cetera. So these are things where even though, you know, again, it's the general ledger, it really does have a lot of detailed information and, and that shouldn't be uh, forgotten. Uh, but, but again, uh, when we think about fraud, I think we're mostly looking at the uh, financial statement area. Okay. Uh, continuing on, you know, with the fraud concept and, and things to think about from a really high level, uh, the SEC named the CEO or CFO uh, for some level of involvement in 89% of fraud cases, uh, which was up uh, from the 97 study. So this was done, I believe, in 2010. <clears throat> Excuse me, and the, the link is there and, and uh, as well. Uh, but if you type in COSA.org, you really can find everything. It's, it's actually interesting to look at both uh, of them. Another key note is that revenue fraud accounted for 60%. And, uh, you know, what I find, and it's up as well, um, and what I find is when you're looking at, uh, when I'm looking at the general ledger, revenue and income statement impact of every journal entry is really interesting. You know, like every journal entry that has a revenue uh, uh, aspect to it, 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 we should be pulling out and taking a look at, uh, even just to understand the nature of, of all the entries, because that's really where it happens. I mean, you'll, you'll basically have this one sort of weird two, two uh, uh, one debit, one credit entry for 1.8 million or something, and it's, it's done right at year end, and, uh, uh, and it helped them kind of make it, uh, uh, you know, to get over that quarter or year end uh, sort of uh, profit margin expectation. Okay, with, with all that said, uh, you know, I, when I'm taking a look at the data, it's sometimes hard to see the CEO and CFO in there, like they generally don't post entries themselves, uh, but, but I think it, it's something to think about if you do see them in there, and then also definitely look at the revenue areas as well. So I'm thinking, how do I make this an analytic? That's, that's how we pull it. This is uh, also uh, an article from WorldCom, uh, great article, uh, it's back in 2002, so it's a little while back, and Cynthia Cooper uh, who, who I know, I believe is still a speaker uh, uh, quite a bit on uh, controls. Uh, what I found really interesting is she worked with a fellow, uh, I believe his name is Gene Morse, and it's right in there. And uh, in the beginning, he, he kind of found some you know, strange entries. And it was just interesting to read the story because it really went through the, um, uh, the whole process of how they found the fraud and you know, how there was a little bit of uh, kind of static in, in trying to get the data and, and pulling it together and all that. They had to come in in the middle of the night and you know, do this analytics. It was, it was very hush-hush. Uh, um, kind of stuff, but but you know, using analytics, uh, they found all of uh, really the WorldCom fraud. So uh, I like to always mention that, and and it was in I believe it was in general ledger type activity. Okay, uh, right about that time, kind of interesting. About a year later, 
2003, the AICPA came out with a practice alert on journal entries. So, you know, Gene had an effect, or, or maybe this was in the works already, but um, th this is something to look up. It's a practice alert. Uh, you know, you can type in practice alert AICPA 2003-02, uh, and it, it, uh, I, I'll try to include it in the files, actually. I, I'll try to remember this. We, we didn't, like, list it as a file, but I know I have it. So I'll try to, I wrote down a note to myself. Um, what I'll do is uh, data files, of course, for almost everything you see today will be provided to you so that you can get them and play with them uh, afterwards. Uh, and there will be a video as well. So I, I just noting that while we note this file. What, what's really cool about this article, though, is that it listed up about 10 or 12 uh, types of journal entry tests that you could perform. And I think every one of them I'm talking about today, so I mean, it's like I think we have it covered, uh, but it, they're pretty simple, round dollar journal entries, weekend journal entries, uh, you know, entries that, that were, you know, sort of at year end or right uh, after year end adjustments that, that, you know, corrected for previous year ends, uh, that kind of thing. So, uh, but a good article, definitely take a look at, and I, I think there was some, you know, response there to, to the uh, WorldCom fraud uh, in writing that, uh, but I'm not sure. Um, okay, taking a look at financial statement indicators, I am probably as bad as everyone else at doing this, truly, but I know what to look for, and I'm providing you a lot of statistics on this, but, but it is something that I, I haven't spent as much time with uh, in, in kind of, you know, taking balance sheets and income statements and lining them up and doing this, like, horizontal and vertical analysis of, of uh, over time, and uh, I think it's a great thing to do. Uh, I, I think the external auditors do it quite a bit. Uh, and then for internal auditors, I, I think it would be a great exercise, but, but uh, maybe difficult to do. Uh, with that said, uh, and kind of getting to the uh, other potential files that uh, we could be talking about today, or, or that I'll be sending you, hold on. Uh, this, I'm just going to carry over a, a file that you can see in a second here. There we go. Okay. So here's the uh, matrix. What, what I did, uh, and this is going back a while, but I read a lot of books on this topic. It was very kind of intriguing to me. I took all of the, I, I don't know if you remember this slide from just a second ago. I, I tried to take all of the major financial statement fraud schemes, which are you know in this right-hand top uh, corner here, and uh, for that, I tried to find the various ratios that would align to that. And uh, not only ratios, but, but even like, you know, increase or decrease. So like if we have an increased uh, quick ratio or current ratio, that can be a sign of overstated revenue because the theory goes you're going to create a bogus accounts receivable and it's going to sit there. Uh, but at the same time, uh, and I believe the day sales outstanding will also increase. So it's something where, uh, you know, because this old uh, invoice is kind of sitting out there. Uh, so, you know, these are all the, the theories here. Uh, I tried my best uh, to not only list for you the various ratios that, that are listed here with a comma, uh, that kind of aligns to this other spreadsheet. So I, I have this other spreadsheet here, uh, it's a tab, excuse me, and it has all the ratios and does like a technical description and a calculation, and I, I really did my best here to try to uh, explain, you know, why should we, what, what should we be looking for and, and why are we looking at this uh, particular uh, type of ratio. Again, I, I give it out there. I, I hope you use it in some way. I've used it in some extent over time, but I have to admit uh, I haven't used it much. Uh, but it, it, just a, a small funny story here is uh, when I started one job uh, recently, well, maybe about five years ago, uh, the uh, CFO said to me, I can't understand it because our business is growing and our accounts payable is shrinking, and it just like from a value perspective, every year it kind of is shrinking, and yet our you know our sales are going up, 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 and it doesn't make any sense to me why that uh, uh, you know be, you know would happen. Uh, and sure enough, I found that there were a lot of receivables that were within the accounts payable that were netting the payables. So it, it and he was right, like you know his eye from from above was able to kind of see that. But yet, you know, he really needed the details, and we, we found all the credit memos and such that, that were truly receivables. Uh, one question, will the matrix uh, be, you be getting this? You will be getting this one. There's only one 
spreadsheet that I'll note that you won't be getting, and it's just because it has some relatively proprietary info in there, and I, I just didn't want to give that one out. Uh, but everything else uh, uh, you will get, so, uh, uh, but thank you for those questions. I, I kind of see them coming in. Uh, feel free to post questions as you go. I kind of watch the screen as best as I can, uh, but we will be shortly kind of stopping for a, uh, you know, for a quick uh, polling question. But um, with that said, I, you know, I, I didn't want to spend too much time on this other than to say you have it, uh, and uh, feel free to make use of it. I think it is, a, you know, something that will work for you. Getting back into the presentation, just wanted to note a few other things. This is, uh, you know, a, AuditNet has a wonderful slew of journal entry type programs, uh, and I believe there's even one that Jim pulled together uh, related to this webinar, but, but again, this is uh, within AuditNet, uh, and, and that's where you can find a lot of audit steps and procedures that you could automate, you know, I mean, so it's, you know, reconcile, uh, you know, let's say the uh, detailed sub-ledger to the general ledger or something like that is, is just a general test. But, but then you could think about how you could analytically do that versus maybe, you know, manually doing it in spreadsheets or something. Uh, with all that, uh, another book out there that I wrote, I think it's 10 years old now, uh, Proactively Detecting Fraud. It's for the IIA. I make no money on it. It was a research paper, you know, but it was great in that uh, I, I had a lot of fun in thinking about, just like with the financial statement indicators, I kind of had to think about all of the fraud types and the types of reports you would run. So this has a list of reports as well. This, this is giving you some ideas of payroll reports, but you get an idea uh, of what's in there. And uh, hopefully that could be a good memory jogger for you as well. This was a, a list of uh, types of entries that you know, are kind of standard uh, uh, risk factor type reports. I mean, uh, we're going to talk more in detail and go through this in a few minutes, uh, uh, you know, one by one in Excel, uh, but I, I kind of want to just have a slide uh, here just generally to say, I, I think what it tends to boil down to these audits, you know, for all the analytics uh, and summaries and graphs that we're going to do, I think at the end of the day we end up running kind of these, these sort of peculiar type reports, uh, entries that are hitting revenue but are not offsetting accounts receivable in cash. And that's like WorldCom, I believe. I mean, it's something where they were capitalizing the revenue. So, you know, that, that's a big one with the auditors. Uh, taking a look at kind of manual journal entries versus automated ones, uh, weekends, uh, uh, things that are kind of at a period end and, and you're trying to, you know, bump up your numbers, uh, accounts that are above average, round dollar multiples, et cetera. We're going to go through these in more detail, but I just wanted to give you an idea of the fact that, that I think it does, these audits do tend to boil down to these reports. The one thing that I'm going to add then is, you know, that I don't have a slide for right here, is I think one of the goals then is to score these reports, to kind of add together these 20, you know, 15 reports and say, you know, of these, that journal entry showed up on 8 of 10. Uh, we should look at that because that's really weird, you know, that it's, it's happening. And, uh, you know, one of the things especially is the uh, keyword analytics uh, work that's in there that we're, you know, going to spend some time on. And, and there's a lot of talk and, and, you know, surveys and webinars around that topic that, that I think you can utilize in the general ledger. Okay, with all that, uh, it's a good time to, to kind of launch our first uh, polling question. Uh, and just waiting for that. So who has involvement in close to 90% of all financial statement fraud? Is it internal audit, CEO or CFO? account manager or the COO. And uh, just a note, uh, we, we do break for these polling questions for NASPA compliance. You do need to answer them. We, you know, we really ask that you answer all of them. Uh, I know Jim went through this, but, but this is kind of the polling question time. This is a great time to ask questions. I stop. I am able to, to kind of take a little break and look at the screen uh, a little better. Uh, so if uh, you do have any questions on what we're doing so far, feel free. And, uh, you know, otherwise, w what we do when we come back, and, and it's usually about uh, 90 seconds or so or two minutes later uh, after we start the polling question, is uh, we, we then will kind of go into more detailed data analytics around uh, the general ledger. <clears throat> So almost all of you have voted. Uh, you know, I'll just leave it out open for another 20 or 30 seconds. Um, and uh, thank you.
Okay, well, let's, uh, let me close this poll and share that with everybody. And yes, 88% of you were correct. The CEO or CFO has involvement in most of the fraud, so it was almost 90%. All right, let me hide that. And on to specific journal entry and other ledger analytics. Oh, and, and let me just, just check here. I think, uh, you, you know, and, and one of the questions, uh, just to answer it, because we're at question time, uh, from a, a data file point of view, the data files will be shared within about a week. I, I think it'll be about five days, though. Uh, and what we do uh, is we uh, put the video up online, and then we send the video, uh, or excuse me, the files, as well as your CPE. And again, I'm going to really try to get it out within the next few days. But uh, I would say by Friday, hopefully, at the latest. So uh, uh, do bear with us. OK. Continuing on here, okay. So on the uh, specific uh, journal entry analytics, I uh, was asked once, you know, how do you do data analytics? You know, how do you find things? And you kind of walk in and and you know quickly can pinpoint stuff. And I like to take this journalistic approach that there's the who, what, when, where, and why to any situation, and and we we need to kind of look at that and understand you know how it fits. So summarizing data by all these perspectives is really key. And uh, just to go a little bit deeper into this uh, uh, graph for a second, uh, you know, essentially there's more data mining questions that you'll ask, like just summarizing it. But then there's actual queries that you run that are actual questions. Uh, really, these, repor uh, sorry, these reports here, where they're more of like a specific type, uh, hold on, th those reports there. So like more of a specific report uh, that, that you're actually running. Okay, and that's a query. And, and I think, you know, a lot of the analytics ends up being more of a direct control, like you're testing, you know, should that person have access? Yes, you know, or no. Whereas control circumvention is almost like the, the WorldCom fraud, and I'm not a pro on it, but it was more where they were posting a lot of entries that were under approval limits. So it, it's something where, you know, they probably had the approval limit for it, and they could post the entry, so the direct control was fine. But because they were posting so many of them, uh, uh, you know, anyone running that report, the, you know, how many entries are right below the approval limit, that's where control circumvention uh, testing kind of comes into play. So a lot going on in that picture, but uh, hopefully it, it makes sense to you. I, I do find from a trending point of view, one, one fraud we found uh, very quickly uh, was just summarizing the general ledger data by day. When we did that, we identified one day that, you know, just looked really weird. And uh, sure enough, it, it was some management of earnings that, that somebody was doing. Uh, and they were cleaning it up. They, they, that was like the cleanup entry. So that, that's kinda, that was the thread uh, that brought us to all of the others. Uh, and you know, I find in travel and entertainment, you know, not to, to you know, get on a different topic, but just trending in travel and entertainment is probably the best way to find fraud, uh, just looking at like director levels and saying you know, whoever's in this director level uh, you know, uh, how many people are above, let's say, $100,000 in, in T&E spend and how many are below it. Uh, and it's very interesting. You'll just find somebody who just completely pops out of the norm uh, and it just doesn't make sense. And then, you, you know, you research more and find out that they, they too are committing fraud. So uh, the trends have a lot to it. I think you can find quite a bit there. What I find too is from a trending point of view to then look for money uh, and you know we're going to now start getting into the specifics but uh, by starting out by looking for money because you know a lot of times uh, uh, people will almost want you to find money you know before they'll move forward on a project or you know find the, the value for it and uh, by doing a bit of cost recovery or analysis of your spend you, you might be able to do that you know just coming up with some good ideas. Uh, what I generally do is get the accounts payable detailed distribution, which really is the general ledger in a lot of ways. It ends up becoming like the general ledger version of accounts payable. Uh, and that data file uh, is the only data file that I won't be giving you because it does have a, some uh, proprietary stuff. And I, I just didn't want to put that in there uh, for, for public display. But you'll see how very easily and quickly you could do this yourself if you had the data. So uh, let's, uh, you know, with that said, we, you know, as you can look at your slides, uh, you'll notice that the next like two or three are uh, very specific tests. And what we're going to do 
is I'm going to start out with the distribution analysis, which is more of like a, a pivot table analytic. Uh, and then what we're going to do is work from there to the actual specific tests that are also uh, a part of the equation. So just bear with me. Let me get this Excel file over to you. Just moving files here. There we go. Okay, so this is a file that you will be getting, um, and uh, let me just get the uh, distribution sample as well. And we're going to be working most of our tests within this general ledger sample file. Uh, so, and, and for the most part, I just wanted to show you that that file is very similar to this file that I'm about to open up, which is the distribution sample file. There we go. So. In looking at the uh, distribution uh, data, let me, uh, maybe that's a little, hopefully you can read that. Uh, you know, for the most part, we have kind of vendor number, account number, description, amount, debit or credit, it's negative or positive, who entered it, uh, and then some information over here, which we just don't need, you know, for right now. Uh, what I did was I created a pivot table of this data, and uh, let, me just, let me just get rid of this for a second. Okay, so uh, when you look at the other data file that I will play with as well, uh, this is the kind of the normal general ledger file. Again, it, it has like a journal entry number, which you know could be vendor number in this case, but but it's journal entry number, account number, debit, credit, and then we have a few other fields, but we have the date as well. Uh, going back to here, I, I didn't have a date in here, uh, but what I wanted to do is kind of just simply show you how we can find some money. You know, so that's sort of the first test, in, in my opinion, is, is see how this thing can pay for you. Uh, the, it, by going to your insert menu uh, in the data file, no matter you know, which worksheet that you're in, and clicking pivot table, it'll do a pretty good job. It, it you know, should do a great job and, and collect all of the data that's for analysis. So the 8,013 rows are, are going to be imported in, and you say yes to that pivot table. Then uh, I have a couple, there's a few different ways to show this. Just kind of drag this over here. So we had our fields that were, you know, back in the distribution test uh, field area. And what I wanted to show is that you can pull the account number uh, into the row area. And uh, you can actually take that back. Let me just kind of jump to the chase here. We'll pull in the account description. Uh, and then I'm going to pull in the vendor number, and I'm going to pull it under the account description. So notice how it puts it to the right. Uh, it's within the account description. And then we're going to take the distribution amount and put that in the value section. Now, that number is okay looking. Uh, it could look better. So I'm going to go into the sum of distribution amount and click the value field settings, go to the number format, and I can change that to whatever I'd like. Now, that, you know, the way to get here, uh, you know, there are various ways to get here in pivot tables and just trying to show you uh, a few things in pivot tables that we'll expand on in a few minutes. The number format is part of the value field settings that you can click there. You can do a lot of things in here. I mean, you can count and average, and we'll be playing with some of these other features in a minute. Uh, but right now, I'm just trying to change that. The other key, though, is that at the top, uh, whenever you click on a pivot table, so if I click here, notice, I don't know, some, my, my ribbon changes up at the top, uh, Excel, but if I click on uh, any uh, item, it then brings up this different ribbon, the pivot table tools. Now, within the table tools, you have a design function where you're able to kind of change what things you know, look at like from a design point of view, but then there's the analyze function. Um, and what I, I, okay, so it's over here, you know, we have sort of the fields and, and they're kind of talking about what's being summarized. And you can click on the field settings and change that just like we did here. But, but I really like to note that this toolbar has like everything, you know, if you can, uh, if you ever have trouble and you're trying to like right click and find stuff, this sort of has every, if you need to change the data source, if, you know, et cetera, there's all these things you could do. Okay, the main thing that I was trying to do here uh, in my analytic, was try to see how many vendors I have for a given account number. So that was sort of my, my key. And uh, you know, th there's 
uh, probably a lot of ways to do it. I personally, I can right click here, by the way, and collapse. Um, and I'm going to collapse the entire field, so kind of bring it down to that level. And now you can see you have all of the account descriptions over on the left-hand side, and then a variety of vendors uh, down the right. Now, if I now expand every one of them, and just scroll out of the data. So now my data file becomes really, really, really small, like almost impossible to read. But you know, when you're at the screen, you can very quickly kind of see uh, you know, one line item. And I'm just going to click on that and then go into it. You can another thing people do actually they'll highlight things too, so that makes it easy. Um, so we, we notice here we have only one vendor, $107,000 for this type of activity. So that's kind of interesting, you know. And and that's something where that might you know could be a fraud or something where there's you know only one vendor for that account. They they kind of posted it there. Um, so that's one thing to look for, even from like a fraud point of view. But but then I like to look at. Why do I have so many vendors for certain account numbers? So, you know, for dues and publications, bad example. Um, so we're going to collapse that one. But what you can do is go down here and literally start collapsing things. What you'll find are things like office expenses, uh, which is here, has so much information in it. Uh, it becomes something where you know there's every type of vendor in here, and th this is where uh, a lot of times companies uh, do go to some sort of a combined spend type uh, uh, vendor, such as you know Staples or Office Max or something like that. Okay, so partially, you know, why do we do this account you know a description analysis here? Uh, partially is to find vendors that are in a sole source uh, type of a, a situation, uh, but also uh, partially uh, to determine whether or not there's accounts that we might be able to source and, and do a better job at. Uh, you know, with all that said, last but not least, to take a look at those categories of where there's auditors and try to align that to your data. So you know, going back to the accounts and, and kind of expanding, collapsing, and you know, collapsing the entire field. Um, just to kind of go through that list and say, you know, which one of these are leases or healthcare or what have you, and what is the spend going to that? The general ledger has that all, all that information, so it's something that you can do, and and hopefully this helped in in just kind of understanding how to take a data file that we have here and build a variety of pivot tables. Because uh, now what we're going to do, just going back to my slides, let me just close this distribution sample. Going back to the slides here, I wanted to then jump into the more specific data analytics uh, for uh, the, the given data files that we have. So, uh, in the the who, uh, you know, looking back at you know what are the queries that we run and and what type of analytics uh, can we run here? Uh, what I like to you know think about and what we'll try to do here is kind of walk through each one of these and and think about how can we you know do each one of these tests uh, within the data. Uh, first one there is summarizing by who, so we'll you know do a pivot table by who and and you know kind of look at that uh, in one perspective. I uh, also want to kind of take a look at maybe stratifying the data and understanding that, as well as maybe summarizing the data on the amount field. Uh, and w why would we want to do that? I, I like to summarize on the journal entry amount field, just to say, you know, how many journal entries have the same amount? And, you know, again, very similar to, you know, some of these uh, frauds that have happened, is it something where you have almost like a repetitive uh, over and over uh, type of uh, uh, entry that's happening in the data. And, and these types of reports, as you can see, are more about the what of the transaction, you know, what accounts is it hitting to, uh, what is the size of the data, what is the uh, amount. Okay, and then uh, just looking at an, another, you know, slide here, uh, you know, before getting into the data a bit, we want to kind of summarize on the amount, uh, which we'll do in a pivot tabling, and then we're going to sort it by high to low, obviously. Um, I also like to look, though, and I note this, I like to look at ones that happen a lot. Um, I also like to look at ones that happen almost like, uh, not a lot, but almost like a, an average amount, but still they're happening more than once. Uh, you know, you'd think a journal entry amount shouldn't be the same number all the time. Uh, but then I like to look at 
you know, amounts that only happen once, you know, so you really want to kind of look at, uh, you know, that. And what I, I usually, and this is where I have this fourth bullet there, you know, score each item on a sliding scale. It, you might want to think about, you know, is it unique that's weirder, or is it the fact that you have so many of them that's weird? Um, I, I find the ones that you have a lot of entries for, a lot of amounts that are the same, it tends to be like a very similar kind of a cruel entry that you're posting and taking off and it's, it happens every uh, month. Uh, whereas uh, things that, uh, uh, you know, that happen once and are, you know, $18 million or something, that's the really weird stuff that, that you have to look at. So number ranking can definitely help there as well. Um, uh, just from uh, a, uh, an analysis point of view, let's kind of dive into the data and I'm going to start out with that number ranking because it's kind of interesting and then we'll, we'll kind of stop for a second for, for questions. But give me, uh, give me a minute here and, <clears throat> excuse me, so, uh, you know, what we have here is kind of the raw uh, GL data and uh, what we can do very quickly is kind of set up another pivot table of this data. Uh, we'll assume it's right. And let me just kind of drag this over so you can see it. I'm going to take the journal entry. I'm going to take the debits and the credits. And you know what? For right now, I'm just going to assume that the debits equal the credits. I know that's a test we'll do later, um, but, but I just want to kind of assume the debits equal the credits. Okay. By doing this, I'm going to take a copy of this data. So the way to do that, um, you hit your control key. Um, so I'm just going to note this, uh, your, your shift key, and then the star button, and you kind of hit all that at once. Um, if, if you can do that uh, in the pivot table, control shift star, which is the, the number eight key, it'll uh, essentially now, you know, take a look at all the data. Okay, so now that I have that, I'm going to kind of go over here, and I'm just going to paste that as a special. And by pasting special values, I'm able just to get the values here. I, I think it's okay if you had that filter mechanism on it, but I personally, I, I'd rather just kind of do values. It, it makes me feel safer that uh, the data hasn't been, you know, corrupted in any way. Okay, kind of same process. I'm going to highlight this data now. Um, I'm not going to highlight the grand total at the bottom, and I'm going to insert another pivot table, so it's like a, a double pivot, right? And that pivot table now is of the actual uh, amounts. So uh, what I can do now is I can drag the amounts into the rows. So that has my amounts. And then I can drag the count, or, or, so that's uh, summarizing the rows. And in my value, I could summarize it. I mean, that, that's one way to do it. But I'm going to go to value field settings, kind of like how we did before. You can get there from the ribbon as well. Click count. And I may even just do a number format while I'm here and make it look pretty. And I'll do it zero decimal places with a comma. So you could do that. Looks a lot nicer. And now we have our count. Now that's, you know, it's kind of interesting. I mean, you, you have all these weird amounts. There's, gosh, uh, you know, 2,500 uh, amounts. So, uh, okay, let me then uh, sort that from large to small but not by the amount, excuse me. In the more sort options, you can go uh, descending by the count of that sum of the debit amount. So the debit amount was the detail value. We summarized it on journal entry, and now we're counting it. And you'll notice here we have $17,000 happening six times in the data. Uh, not a lot of money, you know, but it's still something where it's just odd. You know, it's a round dollar journal entry. It's happening, uh, six times in the data, and it may, you know, if we looked at it, you know, how do we look at it? You then double click on the six, on the values, and it'll bring up the detailed information that, you know, which journal entries are, are kind of making that up. So that, and that, that, get, that gets thrown to another uh, data sheet or worksheet within Excel. Uh, but again, trying to show you how by summarizing the data in various ways, uh, you, you know, but first by distribution and account amount, but, but now just by the amounts themselves, you know, can be a very interesting exercise. Uh, and I, you know, again, now, you know, taking this to the final level here, what I would probably say is, you know, in looking at this data, um, I uh, would, I'm, I'm thinking about this, I almost want to take the summary. Uh, so what I can do is uh, take that uh, amount and try to put a sum in there as well. So, you know, we have the 17,000 times six, which is now the 102,000. So, what I can do, 
I'm going to now sort on that in a descending fashion. And now, uh, what's kind of interesting, I have the one entry for 114,793,509. Um, and that's interesting. I mean, it's just, it's something where you have some of these large, large entries that only happen, or, or the amount only happens once in the data. Uh, that's something to look at because it is unique. Okay. So with that, let me kind of launch the next polling question. It's, it's our time for that. And uh, what is an example of a what question in the general ledger analytic test? Is it extract entries entered by an authorized user? Identify weekend journal entries? Summarize entry by account type? Or summarize by who entered the entry? So what's like a what question? And, uh, you know, we keep these open for about 90 seconds, two minutes or so. Uh, we're, we're doing well on time, uh, you know, from a, a, that perspective. And, you know, what, what's going to continue is we're going to go over more specific reports now. Might get a little bit faster in the way that we're going through the reports. I'm kind of assuming you understand pivot tables by now. And I know a lot of people do know pivot tables in general. I, I'm getting more surprised. I, I used to not find people using pivot tables. And, and now it's like a, a no-brainer uh, for a lot of people. Uh, but definitely take a look at uh, that concept if you haven't. Um, and then uh, we'll get into more specific kind of keyword analytics and taking a look at more of the unique uh, journal entry testing that we can do, which goes beyond just looking for unique amounts. We can look at, uh, you know, other ways. Uh, and then graphing and scoring, you know, so we, we have a lot still to go, um, and, but yet what's kind of good is these other concepts are a little bit smaller uh, in the sense that each one is uh, kind of like a 10-minute concept kind of thing. So uh, I see most of you have voted. We're getting up on two minutes. Don't see any questions coming in. Hopefully, uh, uh, so far, everything's making sense to you. Okay, 93% of you have voted. Let me, uh, I'll just keep it open for like another five seconds or so for those that haven't. And again, just trying to track it for NASBA compliance there. Um, again, yes, uh, summarizing the entry by account type was the correct answer. Um, you know, extracting by who entered it, uh, the unauthorized user, those are who questions. The weekend journal entry would be more of a time, uh, a when question. Uh, so, okay, let me hide that. And we'll get back into the analytics. So, uh, again, using this raw data file, this journal entry data file, it's pretty simple. Uh, you know, for, for at least playing around with and, you know, kind of uh, breaking it and such. Uh, I wanted to, to note, you know, first off, we'd like to kind of summarize, and let me, let me just to kind of speed this up, um, I built an enterer sum here, and the way I had done it, uh, so this is built, and this will be in the data that you'll get, uh, we basically have the years as well as the, uh, uh, the in the columns, we have who entered it. And then we have the count of uh, how many of the, you know, journal entries, let's say, or how many, uh, yeah, journal entries were po uh, postings, excuse me, how many of the detailed postings were in the data. So there was like 20,000, you know, detailed transactions. How many were entered by AC and DC and JL and et cetera. Now, over here I have the date. And I, I'm going to, I don't know if I'm going to really mess this up. I'm going to take that out. You try to put it back. Yeah. Okay. So what what happened was I was playing around with this, and what you can do is you can right click, and this is a good concept to learn, and go ungroup. Uh, and it should, I really should have uh, kind of ungrouped it. Give me a second here. There we go. So by ungrouping it, it gives us kind of every date again. And uh, th this is when you looked back at the data. Uh, the data had it kind of in a daily sort of fashion. Uh, one thing, one really good concept to learn from a date perspective is grouping. So you right click and go group. Now if you forget where this is, again, on the pivot table tools, you don't have to right click in the data, you can just say group selection up at the top. And you know, you have a lot of options when I mean, you can go quarter and, let, let me try quarter and year. 
uh, just to see how that works. You know, so that, you know, we got a few years worth of data in here. Uh, I find that when you look at this table, it looks like gobbledygook. You know, it's very difficult to look at. So, you know, one way of, of getting around that uh, is, is first to kind of go over to, the, I'm going to show you a more advanced concept, go over to that field settings, value field settings from before, right click and click on that field and go in the show values as, you could say either you know, percentage of row total uh, or percentage of column total or percentage of grand total. Um, I, I think I'll do, let me try column total, see how that works. Uh, da, da, da. Yeah, yeah I, I think that works. I mean, it's something where it's trying to give you a perspective uh, you know, of, of how many of the journal entries are, are being posted uh, uh, you know, by person. And it, it showing it more in, in a percentage form uh, sometimes gives you like a better perspective of where maybe to look and where trends are. And you know, like this one kind of jumps out at you, uh, you know, in, in relation to other people uh, for that particular quarter. But for that person, it's not you know, it's not crazy. Uh, what is a little bit high, though? Whoops, is sorry, I, I double clicked on it. Uh, is this uh, twenty one percent, you know, and sixteen percent for that person? You know, so you, you know, looking down the column, you can kind of see, you know, how have they grown or, or you know, fizzled over time. Uh, let me kind of change that back, and I, I think uh, let me just do value field settings, show value as. I'll just go back to the no calculation, but I wanted to show you that because I, I think that's interesting. It, when you graph this in a really cool way, and I created this graph, but I'll show you how I did it. Uh, you know, this gives you an ability now to look at that gobbledygook of data and make a lot more sense of it. You know, so it, it is something where, uh, you know, KD was in yellow, and you notice how the yellow bar here, the yellow bar there, are very strange in relation to all the other bars, you know, and, and, and such. Uh, whereas when you're looking at it here, it's very difficult. Okay, so how do you make a graph? And I, we're going to have a section a little bit later on graphing, but uh, I wanted to, to just kind of quickly note this because we showed you that graph. You, all you have to do is click on a pivot table, uh, so click within the data, and then go to pivot chart. Now, there are a lot of options. Uh, you know, you might even want to do kind of a, you know, this clustered, you know, stacked column, if you could see that. Uh, stack column works well because you kind of look in the stacking and look for things that are jumping out. But if you click all the way to the right, there's this 3D column one. And, you know, depending on, I think this, I'm using Excel 2013, I believe. So this really kind of jumps out at you. Uh, and, and, but I believe when you work in 2010, you get like a blank screen at this point. You don't actually get the graph. Um, but, but, so you have to have faith and hit the OK button and it'll build that chart. Now, what I did was I took this chart, notice how this chart here and that chart there is a little bit different, right? It, it almost like, this is almost like a, uh, I'm looking at it from above and then this one here is I'm looking at it more flat. Uh, what I can do is I can right click on the graph and I can say move chart. I'm going to move it. And I'm going to move it to its own kind of chart page. Now that I've done this, uh, looking at kind of enters activity over time, uh, I can right click the chart again and say C, uh, 3D rotation. Um, now in the 3D rotation you have an ability to kind of move the x-axis around and it gives you some options and then it also allows you to move the y-axis. So I don't know exactly what I had on that other chart. Um, you can almost, uh, I don't want to go too far here, but I mean, you can almost get to like a 90% y-rotation where you're really, you know, peering down above it. Uh, so uh, hopefully that helps. And, uh, you know, I, I do find the 3D graphing is really interesting, uh, especially, you know, you can almost uh, sit within the graph itself and kind of scroll around depending on what's hiding behind uh, another, it's almost like what's hiding behind another building of data when you're looking at it. So uh, that's all in 3D rotation that you can right click and get to. Okay, so that's that. Um, getting back to the enterer, I, I find, you know, just summarizing by enterer is sort of interesting, uh, but, and, and definitely you want to look for unauthorized users, so people that aren't there. But what I find interesting is when somebody has like a lot of activity or, or someone has no activity and they just have like one posting. You know, so it, I don't have that in my data. But I think that's, you know, what we're looking at here is sort of those trends around uh, where people have almost like no postings and then they have a lot of postings. 
Okay. Now, just to change that graph really quickly, uh, you know, from a uh, you know from an analysis uh, point of view, um, what I can do is just kind of change this to more of a sum. You know, so now we're now we're looking at the values, and I'll, I'll just kind of you know just to keep this quick here, we can then look at it like that. And, you know, this gives you a, a different perspective. I mean, now, you know, it looks like RL, you know, is the guy who's uh, posting these weird entries in, in quarter one of 2000, or quarter two of 2013 and quarter four of 2013, but seems to have, like, no other activity, you know, uh, from a dollars and cents point of view. Um, so value versus volume can be a really interesting thing as well. Okay. So this is a who analysis that also kind of brings into account the date time uh, analysis as well. Uh, the other date time analysis, and I, I showed it before, but, but um, uh, bear with me here. Uh, the other date time analysis is just summarizing by day uh, and uh, in, in just taking with me here. These are, these are all ones we were playing with. Hold on. So going back to the raw data, I, I can insert a pivot table and I'm going to be taking a look now at the date field in my uh, rows column, and th this is an interesting thing to show you. Um, and then, you know, the, let's say the debit amount uh, for now, and actually may as well just throw the credit amount as well. Now, what's interesting is when I create another pivot table, a lot of times it, it's it's almost like tied to the last one or something, and, and you know, it, it sort of, you have to ungroup it. So you, we talked about the grouping before. I, I find it almost like takes the, um, uh, the, the, uh, properties of the last time you did this. So uh, you just have to be careful of that when you're grouping and ungrouping. Uh, but okay, now that I've done that, I can now also pivot chart this data. And I could do a clustered column, but I'm going to just do that general kind of line chart analysis. And uh, you know, what's interesting is I think the debits equal the credits. So uh, you'll see they, you know, kind of mirror one another. Uh, but What's interesting about just doing a time analysis, right, like what this gives me that the enter sum didn't give me is just finding those days that look really weird. And, and it's amazing how out of uh, three full years, about 1,000 or 1,100 days, uh, you're looking at somewhere about like five or six or ten that you need to go look at uh, that, that really had a lot of activity within that time frame. So, uh, you know, Pivot tables, we could you know go all day on it probably, uh, but uh, you know definitely uh, something to look at. Um, some of the other tests we talked about is just kind of looking at uh, entries that are happening more in the quarter ends. Um, so you might even want to let me just uh, let me just do one thing here in making this chart just a little bit better. Uh, we'll kind of you know blow up the, uh, the axis a little bit so you can see it a little bit better. And, you know, you can see here this is kind of in June and June 12th, and, you know, let, let's imagine that they're an, an annual quarterly kind of company. Here we have um, the third quarter of 2012, uh, a, you know, pretty major spike, you know, and uh, in looking kind of towards the end of the year as well, uh, having some sort of major spikes as well towards here. So, you know, it, looking at kind of year-end type analysis uh, is also kind of interesting. What would be really interesting, uh, and, and I'm just noting this and going back to a previous report we uh, talked about, imagine if you were just looking at the revenue entries. You know, so forget you know, the entire general ledger where it becomes almost like a wash uh, where you, you can't see anything. If you started to just pull out the uh, journal entries or transaction activity for just revenue and then did a graph like this, that could lead to an entirely different graph uh, because, again, you know, revenue of maybe $50 million was posted here, and that's that little, little line here, and it's dwarfed by the fact that you bought some huge company, and it, you know, now kind of throws the graph off. Another way uh, to analyze data, uh, it, you know, beyond kind of the, the uh, excuse me, the who and the, the when uh, that, that uh, we've been talking about, uh, is to kind of look more uh, potentially at the what itself. Uh, and in, in looking at uh, some of the uh, what questions that you might want to ask, let me just kind of head back here. I like to stratify data um, as well as kind of, uh, you know, look at, at uh, you know, so let's just say from a stratification point of view, 
I'm just going to do this quickly today and say that you know this is a, an add-in that you're going to, you can get for 30 day free trial. I think it's even much greater now. I think it's like 90 day or something free trial uh, that you can get and uh, it's active data and, and it has this uh, really nice stratification and I, I find if you know if there's like one test to perform on any data, you know even if you could just stratify the data, um, that'd be key. What, what I like about this, even though there are ways to do an Excel, what I like about the Active Data uh, product and uh, Top Cats is very similar to this, where it, it, it has an ability in Excel to do this type of work. It gives you over on the left-hand side a lot of statistics about your data. What's the maximum value? Fifty-two, you know, million dollars that's sitting in there. Uh, what's the average value? Sixty thousand. You know, it's a lot of other stuff. But you know what you can do, and I'll just do this very quickly for our sake. You can kind of. I'm going to create ten. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, uh, I'm going to make the interval. Uh, yeah, I think we have too many. You know, I tried to make like a hundred thousand, and it, it stopped at one point. But our goal here is to then stratify that data, and you know, have the the system kind of identify what are some of the really large entries, which are ones are that are you know just kind of. Uh, uh, quite small. If you look at the data, what's really interesting is of all the transactions, most of them are under a hundred thousand. Uh, so you, you know, like ninety-four percent of the transactions are under a hundred thousand, and they're making up nine percent of the dollars. So you know, when you look at the dollar perspective, uh, twenty-six percent or twenty-seven percent of the dollars are being made up by nineteen journal entry or nineteen transactions. Excuse me. So that's postings that are in the data. So I, I still kind of go back to you know if you can stratify data, uh, if you could do one thing, you know you're bound to find within there uh, some some interesting trends and possibly even some trends that are below a limit. So you might say, well, a million dollars is kind of our limit, and that's that's like right here. You know maybe we look at all the entries that are eight hundred thousand, nine hundred thousand as well. Uh, because that million dollar limit is big. Now, in this case of the data, I didn't plan this, in this case of the data, we don't have a lot going on in there, but you know, if you had 195 entries that were happening in the, the 900,000 to million range and your approval limit was a million, just the stratification report alone you know, could be enough for you to, to, to you know, do something with it. So I'm going to cancel that, um, but I, I wanted to kind of show you uh, another type of test uh, from a what perspective and, and get that stratify in there because I think that's a really good one. Uh, I'm just going to head back to the slides just for a second here. Um, and go into the fact that there are a lot of functions within Excel that can be really useful. And uh, you know, one of them being the mod function, which can identify round dollar journal entries. Um, I, I, in my slides, you'll see a little bit later. I kind of put this in the why perspective, like why do we have round dollar journal entries? They could be estimates. That's normal. Um, and and uh, but but you probably should look at the estimates because they're usually the weird ones. Um, but but there are other things like weekday to determine if it's a weekend or you know a, a day, which would be denoted with a one or a seven. Uh, and then there's like left and upper and absolute value and all that, which which is helpful. So I just wanted to note those. Um, okay, so. Now looking at this next slide, you know we talked about some of these already, but I wanted to jump into the weekend analytic. Uh, I also think looking at holidays, if you know that they're holidays, uh, is good, uh, and weekends is good, but I find that the test isn't the best test because a lot of accounting departments work on weekends and holidays. Uh, allow you know from a time you know if it, what I don't have in my list here is looking for times that are weird. That a lot of times uh, computer systems save when the person signed in from a, a minute and second and hour perspective, and this is something where you, you can look at that as well. Uh, but I find accounting, you know, the, this, the controller and uh, others will sometimes work, you know, late into the night. So it's not abnormal to, to see that. From a where perspective, getting down to that, I like to think about what are some of those problem accounts or suspense accounts that you should be looking at. 
Um, but as I've said before, the revenue account, you know, definitely take a look at that. You know, 60% of, of financial statement frauds happening there. Uh, beat that up, <laughs> you know, take a look at it. Um, and then obviously, uh, let me continue on. The why, uh, you know, looking at ones that, that are kind of strange from various perspectives. Uh, so, you know, which, let, let's say even what accounts are exceeding the average amount for that account, uh, round dollar multiples. We're going to talk about key text searching in a bit, so I, I'll leave that one. But I want to kind of take some of these tests that, that I'm throwing up here on the uh, the slides and show you how to do them in Excel. So let me let me kind of now that we're sort of done with the slides, let me head, head back to my Excel. There we go. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, what I've done here is I've created uh, a calculated field, and there's a lot going on here, uh, quite frankly. So let, let me just uh, let me kind of add another column in here just to show you. So let's just say uh, round difference, and and I'll explain what that means in a second. Uh, I'm going to divide uh, actually, uh, yeah, I'm going to divide uh, the uh, total amount. Excuse me. Um, <clears throat> by a thousand, and let me kind of the way to copy that down. I'll just double click and copy that all the way down. What I'm finding here, like notice how this is 2,078 and 40, so that that's right here, and the difference is 78 dollars and 40 cents. That's the mod. What what the mod function does is it it basically divides this by whatever you had. Uh, I put a thousand in, and <clears throat> excuse me, if it is a round uh, multiple, it'll be zero. You know, the final kind of answer will be zero in this field. So, uh, but 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 there's a bit of a problem, and that's why I make this if statement over here that I think you know will leave for you to kind of look at in the data. But it, it more or less is kind of determining if it's zero. Uh, we don't want to consider that round. So that's, that, and let me show you what I mean in a second. So if I filter now to all the zeros, you'll notice that there are a lot of $1,000 journal entries. Remember the $17,000 that, that happened uh, six times. I actually, it, it happened six times in one period, but it's happened even more times in other periods. This is really interesting. Um, okay, but uh, with that said, notice how every journal entry that nets to zero, which, you know, again, is kind of weird in itself that that happens, but uh, that also is a kind of a, it, it leads to this mod function having a zero. So I, I kind of do an if statement over here. I'm not going to waste your time with it, but it, it kind of calculates that that is not what we're looking for. Um, but I still find that that's really interesting. Why do we have journal entries that are zero? I never, you know, really thought about it till till now. Um, so you know, that's one of the functions uh, is the mod function in figuring out round dollar amounts and, and then round dollar journal entries, which also could take place. Okay, uh, in this case then uh, what I want to do is take a look at the weekday function. So let me, let me get rid of my filter. And the weekday function will allow me to take a look at a date and it gives me an answer of a 1 to 7. A 1 is, I believe, a Sunday, and a 7 is a Saturday. So that's kind of how it works. And uh, day of week. And uh, in essence, what we could do, actually, is while we're here, let me unfilter, go insert pivot table. And I'm going to go on day of week. Oops. Well, yeah, there's lots of pivots we could do here, but you know, I'm just kind of curious. Uh, day of week, and I'm just going to do maybe even the sum of amount. So, you know, but let me just do this twice. So, what I'm really kind of interested in, more than anything else, and and just going a little, going through what we've done a, a little quickly here. Uh, I think I want to just do it at the grand total. Okay. So. 
in this case, I can kind of see what's happening by day, and it is interesting, you know, 32% of transactions are happening on the weekend, uh, which is a lot, you know, it's sort of sample data, it's a little odd, uh, but uh, again, it might be interesting to take a look, uh, not only, you know, what entries are happening over the weekend, it could be normal system processing uh, that's happening at a time where no one's around, uh, like an inventory costing module or, you know, something like that, um, but uh, it, it you know, could be somebody kind of sneaking in at, at the middle of the night. Uh, what you could also do is kind of look at who's doing it. You know, so these are the, some of the, now I'm getting crazy here, but these are some of the things that you can start to look at, uh, probably even from a percentage point of view, uh, and, and taking a look by person to say, you know, how many entries am I entering in on weekends versus other times? And it, it might highlight, you know, it, it, what I find is, in this case, you have two people that are obviously coming in a lot on the weekends um, in relation to others that, that are, you know, relatively low uh, on the weekends. And, and, and even for this one, they're also high uh, in, in those, this time frame as well. So they're high uh, on the Sunday uh, in relation to others and, and also uh, for the, the uh, Saturday. So, uh, again, a lot of different ways to go with this, but I, I find that by doing some of these pivot tables, it allows you to very quickly pinpoint in on some dates and times that, that really need to, to be uh, analyzed. Okay, well, uh, at this point, uh, what I wanted to do is uh, continue on uh, after a, a quick uh, break here. I think what we want to do is just, uh, we'll go to the, well, I, I, I think, bear with me one second here, folks. Yeah, I, I just wanted to see, let, let me just go just a couple more minutes here on keywords uh, because I think it might be useful. Um, and one of the tests that we had in here, uh, we've tried, I've tried to talk about almost all those tests that we've had there. I, I didn't want to make it a one for one, but, but at the same time, you know, cover a lot of the key ones. There's a lot of talk right now about, you know, keyword analytics and textual analytics. Uh, and, you know, what are we talking about here, generally speaking? It, it's, it, for the most part, coming up with a database of suspicious words uh, and then look, looking through the entire table. But, but I even go one step further in saying, you know, I think it's a, a great way to even just look at all the words in the table itself. Um, and based on, you know, all the words to try to identify trends within those words. Uh, so, for example, you know, why is a certain word happening uh, over and over again? Uh, for, as an example, like payroll accrual, uh, that phrase happening in, in your data file, if, if that's happening, you know, 10 times more than anything else, it might kind of lead a CFO or controller to say, you know, why do we have so many journal entries for payroll accruals? It, it just doesn't seem, you know, it seems odd uh, in relation to everybody else. But again, these are some of the things that uh, the, the uh, word analytics can uh, do for you. What, what I find is that you know it's really kind of interesting to be able to align the uh, keyword analytics to the the fraud triangle. Uh, the fraud triangle is kind of incentives and opportunities, and then rationalizing. And there are words that people are using that, you know, from a pressure point of view, like meet target or you better make it or, you know, things like these phrases that people use. You could look through not only financial data, but also like email communications and other, you know, web searches and such. Um, but, but then, you know, from an opportunity uh, perspective, you could say, you know, they, they're never looking or, you know, these are all phrases that you could have that, that might highlight like an opportunity. And rationalization, you know, might be something like, you know, we'll reverse it next month or, you know, uh, we'll cover that error next month or, you know, something like that. And, and it's, it's more just sort of rationalizing and, and uh, working off of it. So, um, you know, what do you really need to do this type of search? You know, you really need a word table and then you need the table that's actually being searched so that you can kind of look at uh, both uh, uh, to, to try to analyze it. And I mean, obviously, like the general ledger data, you know, is the, the table to search uh, in this case because that, that's what we're talking about here. So let me kind of open up um, this keyword, you know, analytic. So, uh, you know, trying to show some of these concepts to you, and, and we, you know, between uh, AuditNet and myself, uh, there's a lot coming in this area. I mean, one, one thing I just want to uh, quickly you know, definitely highlight, and I, I know we'll, we'll talk about it towards the end as well again, uh, but 
there is a survey uh, that Audinet has uh, out on the web uh, related to keyword analytics. And, and you know, if you click there, it kind of brings you into you know being able to read more and uh, then take the actual survey. But you know, the, the key of that survey ultimately is uh, to to be able to get a big list of words you know that we can analyze and and play with. Um, and uh, you know, what we're trying to do is uh, to you know come up with some of the top words uh, based on uh, that analytic. Now, uh, based on the survey, excuse me, and, and pulling them all together. Now, you know, how would you do this analysis? Uh, what I find is you, you tend to have, I don't know if I have that here yet, uh, you have like a description field. And I, I think I've, I've broken this out, but we'll, we'll just kind of put it all back together again, um, you know, to increase revenues. Okay, so now that I have this data field here and it's sort of broken up by spaces, you, you, you know, one quick way is to go text to columns, you know, just for that data field. And you could say delimited <clears throat> and do it more at a space kind of level. And that would then break it up, you know, into the, uh, the, the various components, which we did above. So that's kind of like take a description field and break it up. Once you've done that, you're able to then have, you know, having your list of keywords over on the left-hand side here, you're able to then kind of VLOOKUP to that data. Now, you know, what is VLOOKUP? Um, it's, in essence, uh, a function that you're using here. You, you, many of you probably have used this before. Um, and it allows you to kind of look at the data field here, which is the word one, the, the word two, T-O, and then match that over to the keyword list. Uh, and, and that is the list that goes from A2 to A36, which is over here on the left-hand side. And that's kind of my keywords of weird stuff to look for. And then whenever there's a match, you'll get the word showing up in here. So in essence, you create like 10 columns of this. And the way it works is once you make one of these uh, VLOOKUPs and being very careful to have, as I bring up the screen here, uh, oops, sorry, sorry, sorry about that. Uh, being very careful when you do this calculation, notice how it has like dollar signs in there. The, the way to do that is if you hit your F4 button when you select the, the table array, uh, it fixes that table array. So it won't move, you know, but, but what's really nice is once you create one of these, you can copy and paste it as much as you'd like and it basically will kind of stretch, like uh, this formula will now be looking at that increase field, and, and this formula is looking at that one, and, and et cetera. So it's a great way of kind of breaking up the words and then doing a VLOOKUP across the words. Okay, so I uh, wanted to show you uh, the keyword analytics, but let's you know, now jump into our next polling question. We're due. And uh, what is the function to test the round dollars and amounts? Is it left, mod, trim, or round? This is a great time for questions if you have any as well. And uh, you know, just noting here with the keyword analytics, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the the uh, keyword analytic uh, webinar uh, that's coming up, uh, we'll be going through in much more detail and, and giving out you know lots of free tools and such on how to do this stuff. Uh, and I think you'll like it. I mean, I think it's something where I really urge everyone to take a look at that. And uh, those that are taking the survey can go to the uh, webinar for free. Um, so it's definitely something you know take advantage of. It's it's in December, and, and we'll be talking about it at the end. Uh, what I like about it is we will be talking about how to do a keyword analytic search and a word summary within all these different types of products. Uh, and I'll uh, you know we'll be showing that. But again, uh, just noting that. Um, um, and I, I got one question coming in. What is the best source for keyword analytics? 
And you know, th this is kind of the interesting thing. What what Jim and I had noticed uh, in you know, so this is one of the questions, is that uh, you know, a lot of the big four have these data lists, and and the FBI has a data list of keywords, but they're not really willing to share it, uh, given it, it is something proprietary, and also I, I think you know maybe it's against national security or something. Um, but you know, with that said, uh, the survey that we're pulling together uh, with AuditNet has a, I believe we have about 3,000 words so far, but about 1,500 that are unique, and I know it's growing every day. Like every day I talk to Jim, it's, it's gone up another, you know, 20 people uh, answering the survey. Uh, so we're really getting there, and, and what we're trying to do is actually align the words to different types of, of frauds. So, you know, uh, words around revenue fraud might be totally different than words around uh, FCPA violations. So, uh, you know, you want to kind of pick a peer group of words. But, but hopefully this list that we're coming up with as part of the survey, it's, you know, it's all free. Uh, if you take the survey, uh, we'll, we'll be that good source for you. Because, yeah, right now it's very difficult to find it on the web. Yeah, Rich, if I could just chime in here. Uh, we did attempt to get the, the list from the FBI, and they said that if they provided the list to us, it would be so redacted that it would just... Uh, it wouldn't be worth uh, worth sending to us, and I'm not exactly sure what the concerns are with the list because uh, if you go out to the web and you look for uh, keyword list, you will find that uh, uh, DEA has list out there, and uh, I believe that the SEC has list out there for words that uh, are focused on national security issues and but this is you know it's totally unrelated this is not a national security issue the keyword analytics that were pulled together for uh, uh, for the FBI and by uh, ENY were basically for uh, for fraud and keyword analytics for uh, the fraud triangle and foreign corrupt practices act so you know, I'm not exactly sure what the what the issue is in sharing that information because it seems to me that that would be something that uh, that should be available to all professionals, and that was the reason why Rich and I, you know, decided to move forward with the the survey and the webinar was we felt that you know auditors were already doing some of this and they'd be willing to share, and we could then provide what uh, what the IR what the uh, FBI and uh, and EY uh, was not willing to provide or share. That's my that's my that's yeah. my that's my two cents, and I'm sticking by it. <laughs> no, th thanks, Jim. Yeah, no, that's great. And and yeah, I I do find. Let me pause. Let me kind of close this poll and get back to our screen and all that. And we do have um, three hundred. Yeah, I mean, we do have three hundred and sixty-six responses so far to the survey. So if you haven't taken the survey yet, just go out to the AuditNet site and uh, we've just posted a, a, a YouTube video that Rich put together and uh, giving more information on this. So, uh, no, thanks again, Jim. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm really trying to stretch my uh, knowledge there on keyword analytics and, uh, you know, just, just while we're here, I mean, just for one second, I'll kind of... Uh, jump a little bit off point, uh, but I just wanted to show you, you know, there, we're even going to talk about things like wordles, uh, and this is something where you, you can, this is actually every word that's in the list uh, uh, uniquely, you know, so, you know, gift and, uh, oh gosh, uh, you know, a, a, a cheat and error, you know, each one of those words. When you look at this, uh, oops, sorry, 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 let me hide the polling question, sorry, sorry. When you take a look at your screen here, you'll see this kind of funny-looking, um, you know, picture, and it has all these words in it. And again, that's 1,500 words, uh, and it's called a Wordle. Uh, and you could go to wordle.net and make your own, you know, of whatever you'd like. Um, what I also find interesting, from a really a big data point of view, and I'm I almost I'm going to say it, but I almost don't know if it's like legal. And Jim might be able to help me here. Um, I've been downloading dictionaries, uh, you know, from the web. Like you can actually download the English dictionary. Like every word that's in the dictionary, it's just they give it to you like a list, 150,000 words. 
Whereas some people have said that there's like a million words in our language, in, in English language. Uh, you know, you could, uh, uh, again, this is like, it's based on like 150,000 base words is what they've kind of said. Uh, so drive becomes drives and, you know, that kind of thing. But, but it's all based on the, the premise of, of drive. Um, with that said, uh, you know, there's a lot of analytics there from a big data point of view of just taking all the words that exist in the world and relating it to your uh, general ledger uh, data analytic uh, list and seeing like what are words that are popping out that aren't even in the dictionary, just for fun, like a big data kind of question. It, it probably is a lot of, you know, cryptic kind of uh, things that the accounting people put in there so that they know what these entries are, uh, but again, not to dwell on this topic, but it's a really interesting one and, and something that is, is growing by the day is, is literally, you know, as, as Jim tells me, more people, you know, signing up, it, it tends to be growing. <laughs> so, okay, well, uh, moving onward, uh, you know, I wanted to talk about taking a look at account patterns, so patterns that are happening in your journal entry data. And, you know, there, there's a lot of different ways to do this test. Um, I'm giving you one that's a little more complex, and I, I you know, I pray I don't lose you in, in the next minute or two here. Um, but I, I was just going to spend about five or ten minutes, uh, you know, talking about this concept um, and, and note that at the end that there are ways to kind of learn more about it. Uh, because it, it, I find it's more, in my opinion, it's a way more advanced topic. So let, let me just say that. Okay. W with that said, you know, one of the things, sorry, so this is a new data file. You will be getting this data file, and uh, you'll be able to, to kind of go through it uh, again and again if you'd like. One of the things that you could do in a pivot table, uh, and, and I'm just going to create a pivot table of this journal entry data, I'm going to put in my rows the journal entries, and in the, in the columns I'm going to put the account numbers. And <clears throat> the, the goal of doing that is to try to make a kind of like a sequence of the journal entries uh, and, and, you know, really in a simple way. Uh, I shouldn't have summarized that. Let's see how, see how long this takes. But my, my goal here really was to kind of figure out, you know, what are the, so that's good. It, it came up with the count, which is really quite nice. Um, what you could do, you know, conceivably is you could take I, I'm sorry as I scroll out really far and it's really hard to see. I'm doing it on purpose. Take a look at this. You can almost see how the accounts are now at the top and they go across for long, you know, probably long patterns of time kind of thing. Um, one of the things that you could do, and I talked about a left function, you know, you might be able to kind of take the left of the account number as one example and just summarize on that, you know, so that way, you know, if revenue accounts start with a four and, you know, expense accounts start with a five, that that can be kind of a, a smaller, you know, instead of having this grow to, to great, you know, lengths, you could kind of bring it back to a much smaller kind of length. Um, but what I'm trying to get at this, the point here is getting at account sequencing. So let me try to copy and paste this to a new uh, file here, um, and I don't know if it's going to let me. So, uh, yep, there it is. So if I, I copy and paste that, I'm just going to kind of create a, a whole new spreadsheet for this and, and just keep this simple for our purposes. Um, what you now have is kind of a listing of all of these journal entries kind of listed out to the right. Now, what I'd like to be able to do, uh, and it is a little hard you know, to do the way, the way we have it right now, is to be able to summarize now this file so that I can find out how many journal entries have a debit post, sorry, how many journal entries have a debit posting uh, to say the account 10130 and a credit posting to, uh, you know, some other account over here on the way right. You know, I think it's a, a two account way over here, so this 2010. So, it, or 20,010, so it, it's kind of like, you know, how many journal entries look like that? And, I mean, quite frankly, if you have tools like ACL and, and IDEA and others, you might be able to do this, um, but the problem is, notice here, there's so many columns. I mean, it, it, it goes on and on to the right there that you might kind of max out even that product, you know, in, in, in columns. So what I, I found, like I tried doing this first, you know, when I was trying to do this test, and I said, you know, that doesn't work really. Okay, so what did I do then? Uh, I, let me just delete this. What I then did was I, I summarized um, each journal entry, uh, and in this 
sorry, bear with me one second here. So I, I took uh, the journal entries and I, I basically kind of, you know, it's in essence summarized based on the journal entry number and the count. So you have kind of a summary here. And, and notice here, this isn't a pivot table. This is an actual uh, data file. Then what I did was I took out all of the credit items and I put them to themselves. And I, I kind of have, a, a, you'll, you'll see over here, a line and a type. Um, and <clears throat> uh, what, you know, what, what we ended up doing uh, was taking a look for kind of each uh, item uh, in this journal entry item. Uh, we then looked at what was the line number for that uh, journal entry number. And that kind of brought us over here to the, the sum of credits. Let me get rid of that filter. So uh, notice here, journal entry one only had one credit to it. So it had a credit line of one, whereas journal entry, gosh, uh, 10,000 had three lines in it. So therefore, you know, it, it has uh, three postings or three credit lines. And, uh, you know, in a, you know what we uh, ended up doing here is, is just kind of uh, figuring out the line number. Now, the line number is calculated based on this if statement. So again, you know, follow, if you don't mind, uh, as you come back to this file, kind of look back into how we got to the if statement for the line number, et cetera, because this is a hard concept and it's something where, you know, it takes a little bit longer to learn, but yet I wanted to show it to you and, and kind of give you this concept. Uh, what you can then do, uh, and this is something that, you know, there's probably a way to do it in, in other tools, but I've, I've been doing this in active data. Um, and that's to figure out the top and bottom items. So you can basically say, I want to look at the top and bottom items. And this is, I actually want to know it, I want to group it by a journal entry number. And uh, I basically want, of the account number, I want the first, you know, 10 postings. And uh, I want the bottom items because I want actually um, the, oh, sorry, so this would be of the line uh, number. Sorry about that. So you do it of the line number. So what I'm trying to say here is by journal entry, I want the bottom line numbers, which would be 1 through 10 for each journal entry. And you click finished. And it then gives you that bottom 10. So that the bottom 10 is what I had over here as well. And you'll notice ones that, that have like three lines in them are, are there. Now you do the same thing for the debits. So I, I did that over here for the debits as well, where we summarize the debits and we figure out the, the, the 10 for the debit, sorry, so we, we do like the bottom uh, 10 for the debits as well. And I copied and pasted all that stuff into this one file. I just literally like took the top 10 uh, credits, and the, uh, the bottom 10 credits, and the bottom 10 debits, uh, line numbers, and I put them into this file. And, and what was always interesting to me, no matter what journal entry system I'm looking at, uh, is that most companies only have, like when they have a journal entry, there's only like two postings, debit, credit or maybe like three debits, two credits, but they're very few. It's, it's amazing how many journal entries are just two items uh, in the data. But uh, with that said, and that, that kind of follows when you look at this data as well, but, but now that you have this, and it's instead of it, remember how before we had all the account numbers going in columns and it went out for maybe 100 columns? Now I've, I've kind of scoped it down to 10. <laughs> so it can't really go much more, and I have 10 credits and 10 debits, so you know, there's only 20 columns now that I, I, I stop at 10. And the reason I stopped at 10, again, is because most journal entries don't go beyond 10. Uh, but, but okay, with that, I then pivot that activity, notice the 10 credits, 10 debits, and then that allows me to actually figure out, uh, let me kind of get it to a, oh gosh, kind of a summary of all this. What I was able to kind of figure out is that what, you know, how many entries do I have? Let me just uh, get rid of that. How many entries do I have that, that have a certain sequence to them? You know, so now that I have like the top 10 credits and the top 10 uh, debits lined up here, now that I've kind of summarized that, in this summary here, you can actually then see that we had 450 journal entries that had uh, a debit over here and, and one credit over there. We had 427, you know, that had a debit here and, and a credit there. And, and you, in essence, can kind of see the pattern of the journal entry. And, and as I said, you know, there are very few that, that go on for like 10, uh, 10 accounts, uh, 10 credits or 10 debits. Most of them, like in this case, you'll see this one debit and then a bunch of uh, credits to the right. The, the reason I do this is it's really interesting to then look at this count. 
and see, okay, this is a very repetitive entry based on the accounts that are being used within that entry. And then way down here, these are entries that happen once. And you know, here's one that, that well, I don't know, that whichever one is a large one, we want to look at those, you know, very large ones that are unique. So th this allows you to find unique journal entries that are more based on the account sequence that's being used versus you know, just debits and credits and, and such. But, and I did want to show that as well to you. So uh, I apologize, it's a little more complex. Uh, do urge you to take a look at the file and, and the way that file works, uh, you'll see how the tabs kind of work to the right. So as you kind of go to the right, the, the system builds itself basically. So at the end, you end up with uh, quite a bit of information that, that's useful. Okay. Now, I, I wanted to touch on graphing and scoring, you know, as we sort of close out the, uh, the, the morning or now afternoon for us. Um, and, you know, in, in looking at uh, graphing and scoring, I think we've done a lot of graphing already. You know, so I mean, generally speaking, I, I wanted to kind of note that the pivot chart is really a great way uh, to, to get a lot done uh, and, and not really have to know what you're doing. I mean, it's something where you can, uh, uh, you know, kind of just click on a button and it, it, it uh, gives you a, a final result. Um, we talked about grouping on date ranges, and I did want to you know, mention that again because I, I think that that's a, a very useful way of kind of summarizing things. Um, I also, you know, one thing that I really like a lot, and, and I'm going to, you know, I have a, something ready to kind of go and hopefully it'll work uh, for us, is a, a scatter graph where you're looking at differences in uh, the uh, time frames. Um, and what, what I wanted to show you here is from an account point of view, like if each one of these dots on the board here was a, a, an account, a general, a general ledger account. What I want to look at is the difference in the account from a change point of view between 2013 and 2012, let's say. Um, and that difference is going to be in a value perspective, which is on the horizontal axis, and then a, a, a volume perspective. Uh, so value is horizontal, volume is, is vertical. And, uh, you know, so we'll look at both perspectives. So uh, I wanted to kind of jump, you know, I think we did enough on the, the general kind of charting, um, but I, I wanted to kind of jump in now and show you the scatter graph. So just bear with me one second here. So, you know, hopefully you're, you're getting better at pivot tables because I built this one and figured we'd just use it for our purposes. Um, I think what I'll do just to keep this a, a little simple here is we're just going to kind of go off of the sum of debit amount and the count of debit amount. Uh, and the way they've lined these up I don't like, so I'm just going to, uh, well, Yeah, no, actually this, uh, th this should work out quite well. So um, what I'm going to do is I, I kind of just did a summary by year of the value uh, by year and uh, the um, uh, count by year for the debits. And, and again, just to kind of give you a, a relatively simple example, but, but show you how the scatter uh, uh, difference works. Um, what I want to do is, is then paste this data, but it's not going to let me. Hold on one second. So I'm just going to take 2013 and 14 from a count and a volume perspective. I was hoping not. Let me let me try to get the whole thing and then let me bring that over here. Hold on. So I built that pivot, copying and pasting that data, and I have my values here, 2014 minus 13, and then my count 14 minus 13. Let me kind of just. Over here, I'm going to say value difference, and over here, I'm going to call this volume, whoops, volume difference. And the value difference is 2014 minus 13, and the volume difference, whoops, is 2014 minus 13. Okay, and we're going to just try to copy that down. Just give me one more second here. Okay. Let me try to double click there. Well, 
that kind of works. So that was good. Okay, so we have our value difference and volume difference now, then calculated. What you can do is uh, highlight that data and then create a scatter graph of that data. You know, just very kind of simply here. And what that's doing, and, and again, this is sample data. Haven't tried it before, but I wanted to show you how to build the scatter. You know, it looks like we have a lot more activity in, in uh, you know, 13 versus uh, 12, or, or 14 versus 13. Um, so you know, there's, it's kind of like a wide variance here, but it's still kind of interesting to, to look at you know, how we have a lot less activity in, in, from a volume point of view in, in many cases um, in, in some of the accounts. But, but yet we have an increase in value, you know, so we, we have this like, you know, less activity, but lots more money, you know, in this account, less, you know, less volume and then more activity. What's interesting is we don't have any positive uh, volume, but that's because I have sample data and it's, it's not the best for, for this purpose. Um, but hopefully you can kind of see the, the variation of the, the uh, volume value scatter, um, which I think is really kind of an interesting tool. Um, and in your real data, will will work a lot better. <laughs> um, from a dashboarding point of view, I you know what I found is that I like to build a lot of different charts within Excel. And whenever you create a chart in Excel, let's let's just head back here. Um, I had the option of kind of throwing this to a, another uh, uh, sheet, um, but y you have the ability to kind of uh, whoops you can kind of move this uh, you know, back to a sheet, I believe. I've, I've, it's funny, uh, we'll kind of um, uh, move it back to here or something. And you can actually have like various charts, you know, even in this case within charts, or have a chart uh, as I had in the slide here that's part of an Excel document. So you can actually just have like little uh, Excel uh, you know, charts that are kind of set here, but based on data files that are within the worksheet itself. And, and I like to do this because it allows you to kind of dashboard quite a bit in one place. All right, with that said, let me kind of jump into the next polling question because I know it's uh, uh, time for that. Uh, what pivot table function is used to uh, create a chart? Is it a pivot data, group date, pivot chart, or line chart? So, you know, one of the questions I have while you're answering the poll question, what type of, uh, what have you seen after an internal art group uh, shares these tests with the accounting? Uh, did they not use it or, you know, did they, uh, you know, have to change tests because they now know where internal audit's working? Um, what I found was in, in both cases that I've, I've done this so far, it, there was a fraud within the organization, so everyone is a little bit concerned and you know, it became more of a team effort you know, to find fraud. I will say that the accounting reviewer was different than the accounting, uh, you know, the person that was running this test was running it on data that was uh, not theirs. So it wasn't like they were posting this data. This is stuff that, that they were looking at other locations and they were more in like a director role kind of reviewing it. And, and maybe that's a good setup. You know, it's kind of like, what do you review but you don't enter? Let's give you the reports for that, you know, kind of thing. But um, I haven't really seen them have enough of a drive to, you know, I, I, as far as I could tell, to, like, take our tests and then commit fraud based on the tests, you know, kind of thing. Um, uh, but uh, with that said, I, you know, not to say it couldn't happen, but uh, um, is, is something that, uh, uh, you know, we, I haven't really seen yet. Uh, for the most part, uh, they're, they're pretty appreciative uh, of it. And, uh, you know, actually in, in a couple of cases it helped them to find some things uh, that uh, they weren't really fraud, but was more of like a management of earnings at, at quarter end. And they were glad they found it, because you know, that way they, you know, it's, it's, everyone knows uh, uh, what's going on. Right, well, let me just close this poll. I know we're going to leave uh, open at the end for questions, and I just, you know, in the interest of time, I want to make sure we get done it by one today. Um, sharing the poll there, a pivot chart, correct? Uh, that's the way you, you basically make a graph out of a pivot table. So good, good going there. Okay, so 
I wanted to then dive a bit into coding and scoring. I, I kind of I talked about it a bit before, uh, but I think the more that you can summarize data and even go into your data file itself, I, I, hopefully everyone remembers where we did the round function today and you know the mod function where it, it kind of calculated a round dollar amount. What, what I find is by coding your data like that, you know, by adding the mod function of data, the weekday function, um, or even just saying, you know, is this a revenue account, yes or no, and having that as a code field is a great way of summarizing your data. So that way you can start to very quickly strip out, you know, I only want to look at expenses, I only want to look at revenue. One thing that I constantly uh, uh, calculate for every journal entry is what is the income statement impact? Because a lot of financial people, that's all they care about. And, and from an audit point of view, it, it kind of, you know, it sort of makes sense too that that's a, a big area of, of our focus. Uh, so, uh, you know, these are things that you can calculate uh, that you could put into the data itself and then start to, you know, kind of analyze based on that. What is a transactional score? It's basically giving a score for a variety of reports that you're running on the data. So, you know, who, what, when, where, why, all those reports that we ran, we then summarize that and, and organize that by uh, journal entry. And, and we're going to try to show you how, you know, to do that so that we can, uh, you can do that yourself. Uh, the approach, you know, from a benefits point of view, uh, is I really find you find some of the best journal entries this way. You know, it's it's kind of interesting to find a weekend journal entry, but it's really interesting to find a weekend journal entry that's a high dollar amount that was entered by a person that's never entered journal entries. Da da da. You know, all these different reports that you run. If you can combine them all together, you really can kill more birds with one stone. You could pick one sample unit item and you know attack twenty different objectives as part of your audit, you know, and, and that's kind of what we're trying to show here. Now, I'm going to get a little bit, you know, mathematical towards the end here, and, it, it, you know, bear with me. Hopefully, I'll be able to, to do this, uh, you know, well enough. Um, but the goal here is to, to say, well, you know, if a score, it, it, because the scores are, are kind of close, you know, a lot of them get really close together. Um, standard deviation allows you to really quickly pick out scores that are way off and, and ones that, that are not. And, you know, what I find is, is calculating a z-score uh, is also really, you know, useful as well. So it's kind of, you know, let me, oh, actually, I'll, I'll show you this last bit here. Um, our goal here is uh, to, to kind of calculate the percentile uh, to see, you know, what, what is the z-score and, you know, wh where does the per that score fit in the percentile of the entire universe of scores, and that's kind of what we're going to be calculating. What's, what's really cool, these are all the functions that come with Excel, and they really, like, make it a lot easier to, to run. Uh, I'm going to show you a, a hard calculation that, that, you know, you end up just putting in a function, if it, and it does it. Um, and the way that we put it all together is VLOOKUP. And, and I know we've done VLOOKUP already today, so I don't want to you know, spend a lot of time on it, but it gives you, you know, an idea how do we do this. We're, we're just going to VLOOKUP everything together. And last but not least, uh, just for this part of the section here, is uh, the result is a sampling methodology that's it's, it's based on risk on how you define it. So you could define risk based on 10 reports that you like the most, that's now, you know, risk to you, and, and that's what you're going to take a look at. So um, in looking at how to do this, let's just take a look at our final Excel file of the day. And what I wanted to show here is just kind of scroll back a little bit. We have a lot of VLOOKUPs in this uh, tab that you will be getting. Um, and what I did here is I... Let me just kind of drag this to you. Sorry, um, call that z-score. <laughs> that was a little sloppy. Sorry about that. Wanted to make sure you had the right tab there. But um, what I've done here is I've I've pulled together into this one top-weighted page all of the different scores uh, associated with a journal entry. Um, so. Uh, for that uh, journal entry number, not supplier number, we, we took this from the AP uh, section. Um, for that journal entry number, does it show up on each one of these reports? So you can go to sheet one, which is report one, and do a VLOOKUP to here, and then carry over column two, which would be the score 
Um, and what's kind of cool about this is you can score, if you had, let's say, seven reports that you were running, you could score report five with a point two and report seven as a point one five because they may have more relevance for risk than a point one to you. So that, that's kind of the differential of, of uh, percentages there. Okay, ultimately, uh, we're then kind of combining back that score, uh, and let me just double click on this so you see it. We have a VLOOKUP of journal entry number two. We go to sheet two, which is report two, and then we're kind of looking at the entire report two and bringing over the score if it's there. So we go over to that sheet two, which is report two, and grab it. So again, report three would go to sheet three, and uh, and if you put all this together, in a, even in Excel, you know, report one, two, three, four, five, and they're all kind of laid out here, you can make this like summary lead sheet that then has the final score calc over on the left hand side. Just to get to the Z score, you know, just in the final minutes here, um, and what's kind of neat about this is if you have that score, um, this goes through this wonderful calculation of um, taking the mean of that score, figuring out what is the difference to that mean, of the score to the mean, uh, the mean is uh, up here, C4, uh, which is uh, basically the total score divided by the total observations, gets you that 12.3, that's added all the way down here. And then you get the difference to the mean that you then square, and then, you know, et cetera, but, uh, and then, and sorry, and then you divide that by the uh, standard deviation uh, percentage, uh, F4, uh, to then get the Z score, and, and et cetera. Um, but, but what I really liked was that at the end of the day, forget all that stuff, um, what you really all need to do um, is to, you know, just, if you can just get to the Z-score calculation, um, which I'm pretty sure is the standardized formula. So, you know, forget, this is all the math that, you know, you, you could learn if you want to. Um, and and uh, things like Khan Academy, et cetera, are really good for this type of thing, uh, if you've ever seen that on the web. But then the Z-score formula is just using standardize. You know, so you basically say standardize A8, let me just double click on this. So it says standardize A8, which is 14, depending on the mean, which is 12.3, and then divide that um, by the standard deviation of that mean, which is up here at that 4.82. Um, so you know, those three kind of fields get put together, you know, how did I get the standard deviation? Again, it's standard dev, like standard dev, and it's from A8 to A2599, so let me just double click on that so you see it, whoops. Okay, so it's highlighting that entire column A, you know, so that, that's kind of standard deviation, the Z-score formula, why am I doing all this? So then I can calculate a normal distribution which tells you the percentile. So basically 16.2, let me just kind of give you an example here. If, if you have a 16.2, you're making up at least 79% of the population. Like there's that many more scores that are below you at that point in, in the scoring range. And what you're looking for are percentiles that are the highest, you know, so ones that are, uh, you know, 80, 90, 100%. Those are the ones like this, uh, this 100% here and that 88% there. Those are the ones that have the most uh, uh, percentile. And, and what I find is you could just look by score and, and sort it high to low for, def, you know, for sure. But I like looking at the percentile because it gives me a more of a perspective. You know, like this is really low and this one's, you know, it's getting there, it's kind of high, you know, this one's getting there 79%, that's kind of high, but, but then as you get up into the 90s and 100s, that's really where you should be focusing, right? So um, I like Z-score, it's another way of kind of taking scores and, you know, going one step further with a Z-score of your score, uh, but uh, again, I uh, want to show you that as well. So let me kind of get to this last uh, polling question. Uh, and then we'll, uh, you know, obviously have just kind of some closing words and other things uh, to talk about. But what function is used mainly to align all of the uh, spreadsheets together so that you can calculate a score? Is it mod, find, mid, or VLOOKUP? And this is a great time to kind of ask any but, sorry, ask any final questions. Uh, we're about six minutes away from, from the end, and uh, we really just had more or less closing remarks, uh, talking about some of the files and videos and such that you'll get. 
uh, as well as the survey, the free survey uh, and, and webinar that, that we have that uh, we, we do uh, hope you take a part in. So I see many of you have voted. Uh, you know, again, uh, from a questions point of view, if you want to throw them in as well, um, I'll try to keep this open just for you know a minute or two as we're going here, and then we'll we'll close it out. But we're we're uh, uh, on time today. Let me make sure I've gotten all of them. So you know the last one would, would the last analytic tell us what journals to you know to turn our focus to absolutely um, you know and, and then the next one you know well uh, let me just go on this sorry this first question would, would this last analytic the z-score uh, and and the scoring you know tell us which journals to focus on yes and and I find it's a, a much better way uh, of finding them because you really get lost in all these reports and you know by by scoring it, it's a way of kind of pulling it all back together into one score. And if you z-score it and do that percent off thing that I was talking about, it, it even makes it easier to kind of see where, where things lie uh, out there. So yeah, no, I, I think I, I find scoring, I mean, it's, it's why your credit card company calls you up and says, you know, you've been making weird transactions, we wanted to call you up. Um, what do you re recommend as next steps to getting uh, deeper learning of applying Excel analytics? Uh, you know, we, we have a lot out there, obviously, in our webinars that we're, we have. Uh, but, but you know, I have a we have a free website as well, auditsoftwarevideos.com, that uh, can you know provides probably about 20 hours uh, of Excel videos uh, in analytics and pivot tables and graphing, uh, some general ledger tests, a lot of other types of tests. But it, it's it really gets you the concepts down. Um, I, I find MrExcel.com is another good one, but let me close this poll so we can actually you know, finish up on the slides here and share that. Most of you uh, had voted, 96% of you. Uh, VLOOKUP is, is the function that's used to kind of bring together the scorings. Um, and yeah, I mean, just to, you know, again, kind of getting back to my slides here. I'm going to leave this last slide in here, kind of key mantras of general ledger analytics. And, uh, you know, I, I do just a note here, I mean, I think the more you can get the data from the, uh, uh, the, the externals uh, or, or just for yourself and, and analyze the entire company, it really is like the lifeblood of the company. I mean, you really can learn a lot. You can save a lot of money. Hopefully, you know, identify some process issues. Uh, we, 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 you know, we, you can identify fraud. It has happened. I've done it, um, but it is. It doesn't happen that much. Uh, I usually find a lot of kind of sort of like mismanagement or or just where people didn't realize things were being processed that way. Um, you know, obviously questions. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. So the poll is not hidden. Apologize. Thank you for that. So uh, just going back to that final slide, uh, which is in your slides as well. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, on, on just the key mantras of uh, GL Analytics, uh, which you'll see there now. And uh, just uh, continuing on here, obviously if you have any questions, feel free to post them. You know, just taking a look, these are ones that are in the queue. Obviously we're, we're at the October 7th one, but uh, many more coming up in the, the coming month or so. Uh, and we're capping it off with that uh, right now, or at least I'm capping it off with this December 3rd. Uh, keyword analysis of organizations' big data for error fraud detection. Um, this is the link to the survey. Uh, there, there is this free webinar devoted uh, to it. You can get there through AuditNet, as we showed you before. It's a lot easier. Um, just a couple other last notes here. Active Data for Excel, which I showed you today, it, it does a lot of cool stuff. I mean, it, it we, we really, I, I think I only showed one or two items, and, uh, you know, there is, through that link, an ability to get the product at a much greater discount, so do take part in that. And Audit Software Videos, uh, another uh, you know, website that uh, you know, hopefully you can find some value in. Um, I'm just bringing it over here so you can see it real quick. 
you can either log in or you, you know you can register here and just register for the training and once you're in you can take a look at courses in ACL, Excel, Access, Active Data for Excel, IDEA and uh, right now all this stuff is free. Uh, we do have some data files that we sell uh, as part of this but uh, you know for, you can still learn a lot without the data files so you can uh, take a look at it. Um, is there an annual fee for active data or is it a one-time fee? Just, I mean, uh, not to talk pricing too much, but uh, it is a one-time fee. Uh, Top Cats is more of a subscription basis, I believe, but I, I know that active data uh, is a one-time fee. Um, we do thank you for today. I, I know I'm bumping up on the one o'clock. I hate to go over by you know too many minutes here, uh, but, but uh, wanted to pack it all in and tried to get you a lot there and uh, you know, hope you enjoyed the presentation today. Uh, we really urge you to take that survey w with regards to the webinar for keywords because it is uh, free and then gets you into the webinar for free. And any words that you can find if people out there uh, can share them with us, like Jim just mentioned the uh, DEA today and the SEC list, which I didn't even know existed, so that's awesome. And, and I'm you know, going to start Googling that uh, because I, I do find that, that that's a really useful uh, you know, tool to, to have. And you know, the more, we, more words we can get, the more we can start kind of breaking them up into different pieces. Yeah, Rich, um, just a, ca a caveat on those lists that I mentioned. Uh, they're more focused on national security issues and terrorism and things like that than they would be on on fraud and uh, foreign corrupt practices act so i'm not sure i'm not sure if they would be valuable but it's just it you know it portrays the point that basically you know those lists are made public whereas the ones that the FBI and ENY are not made public, and I just don't understand why, other than uh, proprietary information and also the fact that uh, you know, uh, the big four can charge a fee for, for those. So. Yeah, I, I agreed. I mean, what I was finding is a lot of my clients were coming to me saying, "Hey, do you have a list of keywords?" And I said, you know, "No." You know, I mean, it's a, I mean, I had I had a list of like two hundred, mm -hmm. but I didn't have a list of fifteen hundred. You know, kind of thing. And uh, yeah, no, agreed that 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 was the impetus of all this in a way. Of, of uh, so, this is great. Uh, and it's it's a great free sharing. You'll get the list of keywords, and we're trying our best to even. Uh, to, to break it up into different languages, uh, I you know we, we wherever people have helped us kind of do that, um, we're even trying to get it into different languages. And as an added bonus to that, Rich, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, you and and Steve have been developing some tools that basically you know will be useful in gathering keywords for the organizations as well. Yeah, I mean, you know, tools like Active Data have even built it in, and and Ar like uh, Arbutus and ACL, they they and Idea, they built a lot of this stuff in, and we're actually going to, uh, you know, giving away uh, like Excel tools that like you click a button and the macro will kind of do a, an analysis and, and a keyword type analysis for you. Um, you know, there's scripts that we're going to give out uh, for ACL uh, that does like a summarization of all the words within a file. Um, and I, I'll just note here, I mean, for, you know, to the points of uh, word reviews, uh, you, you can actually just look at why certain words are happening a lot, and, and that helps you understand the transactions. You know, forgetting, you know, looking for fraud words, you can just look for, like, what's happening in the data, and, and it gives you this different perspective, uh, very similar to, you know, looking at it by day or, you know, by amount. Absolutely. And we could go on and on with this for another you know, 25, 30 minutes. And in the interest of time, though, I just want to thank everybody for uh, for joining us today. And thank you, Rich, for putting on a great presentation. And we look forward to your taking the survey and joining us for another webinar in the future. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Jim. Bye.